Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of West Valley Workforce Success Series. We're so excited to have everyone here with us today. Today, we're going to focus on experiential learning in workforce. We're joined by a very impressive panel that I'm so excited to hear from. Gentlemen, if we can go down the line, I would love to hear who you're with, um, what your company is doing in regards to workforce experiential learning, please. Sure. Um, my Hi, name is Strisnack. <laughs> I'm the CEO of Brazo West uh, campus. One of the things that we love about experiential learning is uh, it actually gives you the chance to really experiment with what you're doing. Uh, so in healthcare, you know, it's uh, glorified on TV a lot of different ways sometimes, but you know, when you're actually doing the job, what are the details that you really need to know? What are your passion points? Do those connect with those passion points? And so uh, to have that opportunity before you commit a ton of time and resources uh, going down the training pathways, uh, because uh, any of the licensed clinicians, um, you know, the, the training tracks can be anywhere for two years to, you know, a neurosurgeon about 17. So uh, it, it's, uh, it really helps give the opportunity to experience what's going on and if that connects with who you want to be uh, moving forward in your personal and professional career. And I think that what that truly does is it makes sure that the time and dedication of resources from the organization, from the, those proctoring, the teachers, really make sure that everybody's aligned um, so that when they do hit the workforce, uh, that they're they're excited about uh, their own uh, career choice and what their uh, next stages of growth are. My name is Martin Cook. I'm the uh, main uh, mechanics uh, instructor out at United AV Academy. The United AV Academy is located at the Goodyear Airport and it's a flight school. That is a subsidiary of United Airlines. Uh, a couple of years ago, United Airlines, uh, to address the pilot shortage, uh, bought a flight school. And we've been uh, staffing and creating and developing out the flight school on the pilot side. Uh, in order to support that mission and that goal, uh, we need mechanics to take care of the aircraft that they're using. And so about a year ago, uh, we developed a apprentice program. Uh, it's registered uh, with the state of Arizona now. It's a three-year program where we are uh, taking uh, people with little or no experience and at the end of the three years, uh, having them to where they're ready for their FAA certification as uh, aircraft mechanics. So uh, we're in just finishing up the first year of our program and uh, excited to see how that's really impacted our business in a, in a positive way. Uh, well, I'm Adam Odaka. Um, I'm the director of workforce development for Corbin's, which is part of Knox Group Companies. Uh, we specialize in construction, uh, anything from prefabrication to electrical construction, and, uh, general contracting, things along those lines, and uh, experience in work, uh, work learning, work based learning, sorry, um, is attracting young people and even people who may have started off in an alternative career or entry level position at a uh, entry level, uh, I'm sorry, uh, company, whether it's McDonald's or something along those lines, or maybe you're just getting out of high school, we offer opportunities to get into an apprenticeship, um, earn while you learn, learn the business of, of construction and, and all the things that it has to offer uh, and make a good salary while you're doing so. We offer a free education, four-year program, and uh, just ultimately a foundation to uh, carry you on through the rest of your life. Perfect. Thank you, gentlemen. And I apologize. I was so excited to jump into it. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Lauren Serrato. I am Westmark Special Events and Media Relations Coordinator. So we're going to jump right back into it. Matt, I want to start with you. When we talk about apprentice apprenticeships, a lot of the time people refer to construction trades. And again, while it might be at the top of our mind, when we talk about these young people, like you mentioned, it can be so intimidating, I can imagine. So at Corbin's, how do you tackle that? How do you try to ease that intimidation part of joining a field like this? Um, it's certainly very intimidating. Um, there's a persona out there that, you know, construction, you're going to be doing manual labor on an everyday basis, and it's going to be a lot of hard work. And ultimately, it is hard work. However, uh, one, of, one of the things that you can do to I guess, make it less intimidating and get slowly introduced to construction is, you know, join like a prefabrication shop. Uh, one of our sister companies or part of Knox Group is um, Knox Innovations, where they run a full-blown 60,000 square foot uh, prefabrication 
application shop where they have an opportunity to learn all the material and build you know different components for an electrical installation and it, it gives them uh, some confidence with working with their hands and using tools um, other ways is you know perhaps uh, doing a construction technology class within with one of our partners uh, whether it's, whether it's Westmec or maybe uh, Grand Canyon University uh, pre-apprenticeship program uh, but it teaches you a lot about what construction is is and how it's evolved over the years um, to make you more successful and and help you to ensure yourself that it's something that you want to get into. Perfect, thank you. And transitioning ponds, we talk about internships and how they benefit students. So we're talking about high school students that are getting the opportunity to work in essentially the healthcare field at such a young age. Obviously, that's going to benefit a student getting that opportunity. How do you say that as a win-win? How does that benefit a browser? this type of partnership? I think it benefits healthcare in general, uh, not just uh, Brazo. You know, we're really trying to take the approach that um, when we are getting high school students in, it's really to engage them, to excite them about the field of healthcare. Um, the healthcare, you know, the level one trauma center like myself is basically a small city in and of itself. There's every role from accounting to advertising uh, to neurosurgery, heart surgery, and everything in between. So uh, there's so many things that have to work together in in order to achieve the ultimate goal of a, a better quality of life for the patients that we serve. And so really what it does is it provides um, high school students to see the breadth of what healthcare really is uh, and to get them excited about what healthcare is if that's something that they have a passion for. If they have a passion for people, if they're compassionate um, and have a passion for that, then it really shows them all the things because they may think that I don't want to be a doctor or a nurse, so healthcare isn't right to me. Healthcare is so much more than that. There's so many different roles. You know, there's over... 400 different roles at my hospital uh, that a high school student could see themselves in and understand how they could contribute to the mission of improving the quality of life of the community uh, if they served in one of those roles. And this really gives them the exposure to that. So uh, I think that it, uh, it's a benefit to the student because they see all of what healthcare truly entails um, and where they could potentially fit in there or not. And then also uh, we may identify uh, students uh, that did not even know that that was a component of healthcare. And so then they uh, get excited about that tract and go down that that pathway. So I think it uh, ultimately uh, the benefit to the organization and to uh, healthcare as a, as a field is that we have a, a, an opportunity to excite a younger generation in healthcare specifically. The pandemic did healthcare no favors uh, in terms of making uh, the younger generation excited about going into healthcare. Um, a lot of uh, was, you know, kind of these terrifying images of overrun hospitals and all these types of things. Um, so uh, making sure that um, students get to see that, see what healthcare is today, where they can contribute. And if that's something they have a passion for, uh, get them excited about the next steps of what that means for them. And so I think we benefit because we uh, get access to a workforce that may have never um, have been excited about it before, never, uh, may have never seen that as a, a pathway for them. And so uh, it, it gives us access to a whole new uh, workforce uh, that may not have uh, been excited about anything in healthcare because they didn't think there was anything. Perfect. And then Martin, take me back to the initial stages. We talk about recruiting. We talk about getting people excited to get into these experiential learning programs. What does the recruiting process look like for United 88? So for us, really starting out with the just friends, family, and coworkers. Uh, to us, that's a, that's a big part of the advertising. We really wanted to focus on our local community, having an an impact of where we are at, where our business is at. And so uh, starting off with our, our current workforce, even letting them know that our program exists and letting them know about it. And through that, uh, we were able to uh, actually get started with uh, several of our first classes, get lots of interest. And then it's uh, building out some of the partnerships that we have, for example, with the uh, state, Arizona State Apprenticeship Office, and getting some advertising through them, as well as um, just partnering with different local partners to let them know that we have a program uh, that's a unique in the fact that it is an apprenticeship program. Uh, and uh, for for aviation, uh, we do have schools, local schools in the area, and that's an option. So we do talk with uh, students, uh, a lot of students that are looking at, you know, their different options. Do I go to a school? Uh, most of these are paid schools they go to, or 
you know, do I have an option of getting an apprenticeship where I get paid to go to school for the training? And so really it's been a kind of a grassroots uh, effort in terms of letting our, our, our own uh, business know what we're doing and, and what we're looking at. And through the friends and family and, and different coworkers, we've been able to build up uh, kind of our market share. And so for us, uh, we have fairly, fairly small classes here to start. And so it hasn't been uh, uh, a huge problem filling, in fact, getting over the amount of applicants because there is actually quite a bit of interest in locally in getting involved in aviation and aerospace uh, at this time in West Valley. Thanks. Gentlemen, I think it's safe to say that each field that you represent is vastly different from one another. We talk about United Aviate, Corbin's, and Healthcare and Brazo. The people that go through these experiential learning, it's obvious they have talent. The challenge after that is keeping the workforce in the West Valley. And that's essentially what we want. We want to keep our talent here, keep this young talent here, especially with these internships. Now, I turn to you, Matt. It's easy to say that workforce or businesses will increase that retention if they offer these opportunities. Personally, if I'm going through this program and it's offered at Corbin's, I want to work there because you're investing in the development for me. So how do you see that at Corbin's? How is that offered? How is that shown? I mean, all we can really do is, is um, you know, fascinate them and challenge them on an everyday basis, um, show them, uh, much like Hans said earlier, that there's more to the business than just the installation labor portion, that there is opportunities to advance into estimating or accounting and things along those lines where uh, they can become fascinated and know that you know there's there's a ton of stuff out there for them and they can do all that while you know gaining a foundation where it's no cost to them um, and they're getting a free education that they can take and they can further education uh, whether it's in a university and things along those lines that you get an equivalent credit and start earning degrees if, if that's what you want to pursue. Uh, but it's not necessary. Uh, experience is not necessary. You can just jump right into, into the trade and, and earn while you learn and, and, you know, make a good life for yourself and your family. Awesome. I love that. The idea that experience is not needed. People think that I need to have this amount of experience to even be considered for something like this. So Hans, I turn that to you. That's the perfect example. These high school students are just that in high school, not having the healthcare experience that they may think that they need. So as they go through this program, what does a qualified candidate get as they finish? What does that look like at the end of it? So from the, I think there's several tiers to this. So the, the high school experience that happens during the, like the summer, the summer learning program uh, is really just exposure. It is to making sure that they see, you know, they're going into the operating rooms, they're going into the dietary department, they're going into the floors, uh, interventional radiology, um, you know, they're, they're really seeing all that um, healthcare, seeing the accounting side, all of that. So um, that's truly just an, an exposure to the, the, the breadth of what healthcare and acute care has to offer. Um, from there, there's several other programs that can then uh, one, you build connections uh, that you may not have had um, uh, within the, the workforce there. And it also, you have a, a resource, somebody to help guide you uh, now, if that's something uh, from a career standpoint you want to pursue, you have somebody that uh, you know that you've uh, taken time with and can help you navigate those pathways. Um, as they pursue that and, and, and then go into, you know, trying to find, you know, if this is truly something I want to pursue, uh, you know, what are the next steps? Uh, they have people that they can reach out to and, and connect them on that. And then we also have what we refer to as externships. So as they're going through the actual training for that field uh, within healthcare, uh, they can be externs at the hospital, which allows them to apply their skill set and get paid for doing it uh, at a lower tier than the. So the classic example would be um, uh, for a nurse. So as they're going through nursing school, externs about six months from graduation come and, and join as an extern. And as they get signed off on their competencies for nursing, they get to actually uh, use those competencies. And so a lot of times, uh, you know, a nurse isn't able to, uh, as they're going through nursing school, they can't use any of that until they're actually in the job function and have passed and licensed as a nurse. This actually allows them kind of stair step into that. And then we have residencies that after they're in uh, that new function, uh, they have a residency for a year. 
uh, so that you know we don't expect them to you know be extremely um, advanced, knowledgeable, you know, day one after graduating. So this helps them you know really work with their peers, have mentors, and, and navigate that. Radiology has the same X-ray techs. You know, as they're going through the X-ray, they can get their limited license. Get it one, it's a it's a paid field, and then two, they get to really see what it's like uh, to work on the floor. Uh, one, I think that makes the educational experience more relevant because they can ask real life questions because they're experiencing it, uh, and, and then two also. It's a benefit that they're um, as they're working with us, they're they're getting paid. It's a real job um, and a, an income source uh, as they're going through their school. Perfect. Now, Hans, that's a partnership with these high school districts. Matt, transitioning, this is earlier you mentioned partnerships with Westneck and GCU. Can you elaborate a little bit more as to how that really works and how it really came to be? Uh, so something cool about GCU is. I guess over the years as a society, we've really pushed uh, four year education programs and kind of forgot about the trades uh, since maybe the early 70s, 80s when they had vocational programs. Uh, but GCU gives a they're out in the schools recruiting for the trades and uh, it gives somebody an opportunity to sign up and actually go to a university and be considered a, a full time student, get all the benefits and amenities of a full time student. And then just learn about the trade and learn if it's something that they're actually truly interested in. Um, and then it, it helps them prepare with little things like reading comprehension, mathematics. So uh, one of the education, other another partner of ours uh, that educates our electricians is WECA, which is Western Electrical Contractor Association. And that's the apprenticeship that we use. But in order to get into the apprenticeship, you have to have you know, a high school diploma, there is some minimum criteria. And they're going to give you um, some some tests like mechanical aptitude and maybe basic arithmetic, reading measurements, things along those lines. And doing a pre-apprenticeship program with one of the other partners, whether it's construction technologies through Westmec or GCU pre-apprentice, um, it's going to better prepare them to be accepted into the actual apprenticeship program as they progress their career. Perfect. Hans, I turn it back to you. Hearing from both you and Matt, these partnerships are vital. And again, we talk about transitioning to high school. What would, how do I put this? Ideally, working with the high schools is great, no question. But what is the struggle that might come about, about a partnership like that? How does that, my goodness, I am struggling for my words right here. How do we tackle that, that hurdle of creating a partnership with high schools? I think a lot of uh, the onus in, in the current scenario actually falls on the high school student and parents uh, to find all those pathways. And so if there was a more structured approach uh, through the school districts within the West Valley, uh, that it was a very standardized process process, regardless of what high school that you were in, uh, that if you wanted to pursue a internship and experiential learning opportunity, uh, it was very clear what were available, when they're available, and how to sign up for them. Um, and, uh, and then and the high school actually helps the student navigate that. I think that that type of pathway would be really beneficial um, to students that don't necessarily, um, you know, intrinsically, uh, one, they may not be aware that it's even out there. And then two, uh, if they are aware, uh, don't know exactly how to navigate that. And so I think that you know, taking those hurdles out of the way and making it very clear what is available. And then two, if they want to do it, uh, what they need to do and have somebody that can stair step them through that. I think that would go a long way in connecting, you know, engaged, um, you know, motivated high school students with opportunities that are out there. And so, you know, if we could define that and, and provide some real framework to it uh, within the high schools themselves and then standardize it so it's not different based on each high school because uh, that makes it tough on the business side of it of okay it's this high school so we need to follow this pathway um, i think that would go a long way and in, in, and businesses would be more interested and it would actually you know organically i think uh, foster more experiential opportunities because businesses would know one there's a steady pipeline two uh, it's very structured they don't have to guess uh, people are going to come and three uh, they know to communicate to that they have these opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that structure works um, both in connecting the student and then also the business uh, feeling more comfortable uh, providing the opportunity. Perfect. Martin, transitioning to United AV8, if you could give the audience a little bit of an in-depth, what does the program really look like of student or an apprentice coming out of it? What did they gain in that time frame? So one of the things that uh, we 
really wanted to focus on or setting up the program was uh, the end product, what, what we were looking for. And at the end of the program, we want a highly trained mechanic uh, that is excited about aviation, that has the knowledge and skills to, from day one after the, the apprenticeship ends, really contribute to the bottom line of the business. And so throughout the, the three-year program, and that's one of the things we struggled with was the timeline. It's, it's a long program. Uh, but what we want at the end is not only them to have the head knowledge, uh, which is what a traditional school uh, really focuses on. You go to a traditional mechanic school, typically you're, you're learning the academic side, you're learning, learning um, a lot about through mock-ups and things, but you typically aren't working on live aircraft and really getting the experiential side of it. Um, and we were really going for a blend. And so we really integrated the academic portion into the experiential side of it. So our normal day for our students is four hours of classroom training in the morning and you know six hours of hands-on work on the shop floor. And at the end, what we're able to provide the business is uh, here is a well-trained mechanic that has the academic uh, background. Uh, they've trained, they grew up in our system. Uh, they understand the business almost better than and the, the people that run it because they've been part of every section of the business, uh, but they've also been working on a product for three years. So that learning curve, when you get a new uh, new mechanic, can be up to a year to train them into the system, all your paperwork systems, your product equipment, uh, that goes away. And so we've got somebody at the end who has three years worth of experience on our product, is well-trained, and we have the confidence that they're going to be able to operate at a significant level and impacting our business's bottom line for what we're trying to do. Perfect. And you mentioned that the high level that they're able to do these trades that you're teaching them. But what if they don't end up, ideally, not going through, obviously, you're paired with United Aviate or United Airlines. If they don't stay and they go into a different manufacturing field, that still benefits workforce development. Absolutely. So one of the... Um, Interesting things, one of the struggles that the aviation maintenance side of the house is having right now is a lot of the graduates through the schools and people that obtain their mechanic certificate go work in other industries. And it's a skill set that the school and the trade provides. Uh, we, we have electrical and pneumatics, and hydraulics and structures and welding and wood and fabric. And, you know, there's all these varieties of skill sets that we teach. And so they're trained as a mechanic, and uh, that offers a lot of opportunities. And so we've had students that go to uh, work for uh, companies here in the Phoenix area, Intel, Caterpillar, and uh, just different varieties of things where those skills are going to come into place. So part of our program, we know that not every apprentice is going to stay. That's, you know, our hope we're training for our business to support our business. But in when we uh, look at uh, our program in particular. Um, ours is a full-time paid position. There's no contract. There's no payback that we have. It's not like at the end of the program, you have to stay so long. And uh, one of the reasons that we do that is we know that even if they don't stay with us, they are going to be uh, in the workforce, in the Valley, uh, usually in the West Valley, and they're going to be contributing to a lot of these other businesses with the skill set we've been able to give them. Thank you, Martin. Matt, I'm interested to hear kind of a day of the, in the life that Martin just explained, the three-year program, what it takes to do from day to day. What does that look like at Corbin's? Uh, so our apprenticeship program is a four-year program, um, and it's structured very similar to Martin's program, where uh, the, the difference is that instead of working four hours and then going to school for four hours within the same day. Our program is more along the lines of go to school for two and a half weeks or two weeks straight, and then you're working for five and a half months, um, acquiring on-the-job training and focusing on what you learned academically throughout those two weeks. And that goes on for each semester for four years. Um, much like Martin's uh, program, they're learning a lot of different skills and working with their hands and they're working with other types of contractors, not necessarily, not always electrical, uh, but we all work together to get things built. 
Um, so you start to understand the business uh, from, you know, a, an accounting perspective and budgeting your hours and your and your materials and things along those lines. And uh, you're also working with your hands quite a bit. So whether or not you you end up finishing the program, which we we definitely are constantly encouraging you to do so, um, you're you're making something of yourself, and you're going to be uh, be able to contribute through throughout society, no matter what what field you end up transitioning towards. Um, so there's a lot of basic life lessons that are learned um, throughout the program, um, or just getting into an apprenticeship. Uh, it is we pay for those two weeks that a student is not on the job. Um, they're making their same salary to be learning in school eight hours a day, which is really cool. And, and the program is uh, dedicated, certified teachers that are solely focused on their success. So their ears are open all day long to ask plenty of questions, to take notes. And then the community, um, you know, spending two weeks with your peers uh, builds good community within our our different apprentices, right, at different years. And and uh, they have an opportunity to exchange information and call each other and, you know, ask for help from one another. Um, so it's it's really cool. And then throughout the on the job training portion, um, they, they're required to document their their hours in in different categories of the trade whether it be planning, whether it be certain types of installation, uh, bending conduit, you know, wiring up devices and things along those lines or equipment. And uh, they're paired with somebody who is seasoned, who has been trained, who's got plenty of experience in the trade. And they have basically their own personal mentor throughout the entire, throughout the entire four years that they're being educated. Um, so it, it works out really well. And um, a lot of our apprentices that have completed the program are extremely successful. And the cool thing is it's a really universal, uh, or I mean, <clears throat> demand, uh, the, the demand for ele electricians throughout the nation or even throughout the world is, is really high. So their education that they're acquiring with us, they can use it anywhere in the nation if they choose to move out of the West Valley and escape the heat, or perhaps they want to stay here and build their family and be part of some of these huge um big tech companies that are growing within the west valley and you know and just work their way up through through the ranks so i mean as a follow-up we mentioned how martin and united aviate they're able to fill that gap in manufacturing at corbin's are you seeing that filling a gap in the construction field um it's been difficult really difficult um so the stats are showing that there's a lot of tradesmen, especially over this next 10 years that are retiring, and there's not enough people coming into the trades. Um, so it's been really difficult. And without partnerships like uh, GCU and Westmac and WECA and even some of the other high schools that we work through with, is it's going to be, uh, I guess, detrimental to building anything within our within our community if we can't inspire people and show them that the trades have definitely evolved and it is something that's really rewarding you can earn an excellent salary doing um so. and martin you mentioned that united aba is new to the west valley new to goodyear this program when did you realize that this process this three-year length of this um, apprenticeship was necessary pretty much right away, right away. um as uh, uh, when when the company really formed and uh, they they solidified uh, their goals and what they were trying to do as a flight school in the West Valley, uh, the need for the mechanic became became uh, very obvious. We need mechanics to take care of the airplanes that are going to be flying. The uh, a lot of press is is focused on the pilot shortage right now, and, and well well should be uh, from some camps. Uh, but there's also an extreme mechanic shortage. Uh, and the forecast right now is for probably about the next 10 years. Uh, we simply are not able to find, uh, get the interest in the field and get them through the training and into the field actually working uh, to where uh, it's going to it, it's going to take care of it. So the 
the initial attempts to stat uh, what we were building, what we were putting together, when we saw the shortcomings and the extreme difficulty in that, how were we going to, to find them and getting out into the fields and really trying to find them, we realized very, very quickly that it was, we were not going to be able to fulfill fill those positions with the traditional uh, ways. Uh, we, uh, as with most businesses, we have limits into how much we can compete with other things like the major airlines and corporate and things like that for our segment of the industry. Um, there's only so much that we can do uh, in terms of the, the pay and benefits and things like that within our boundaries. And so we really had to come up with another way pretty quickly of how we're going to support the business. And one of that was one of the, the avenues that we really focused on is bringing people in that have zero experience, uh, getting them excited about the field. You know, Hans was talking about exposing them to something they may never have never known. Um, and uh, uh, also for focusing on non-traditional, uh, what we would consider mechanics. Uh, in the, the industry, especially in my background right now, there is a very small percentage of uh, women, somewhere around 5%, for example, or some of our uh, diverse ethnic groups. Uh, those kinds of focusing on bringing some diversity and stuff into the uh, business, we found that where normally they wouldn't think, you know, young girls, yes, young girls, hey, you want to be an aircraft mechanic? They may not go, wow, I, I, I was just thinking of that. Usually the response I get is, I never knew that was possible. And so exposing, uh, exposing uh, new groups of people to some of the opportunities that we had, we, we found that was a critical piece in getting some excitement about the program, about the industry. And then the question just came up, how do we integrate them into the business in a way that makes the business uh, case for it? Uh, that we could do this as well as what we want at the end or some well-trained mechanics. Right. Hans, I ask you the same question. How and when did you realize that this new approach to teaching young people was necessary and had the possibility of being so successful? Well, first, I need to get some uh, aviation mechanic toys for my little girls just to <laughs> just make sure that they're on board and really know the opportunities for them that are out there. Yeah, um, uh, but, uh, you know, truly... What we continue to see is that there was just massive workforce shortages in healthcare, and using the same techniques and expecting different results is insanity uh, because we were consistently hitting the same challenges. Um, so you really had to, you know, kind of cast a wider net, try different things to engage more uh, people that uh, weren't considering healthcare in the first place. So I think that we really looked at how do we, from a external standpoint, how do we engage those that are going to be entering the workforce? Um, then from an internal standpoint, how do we engage those already in the organization? One, to give them growth and career pathways um, and to provide them opportunities that they may never have considered. Uh, you know, maybe somebody in maintenance wants to move over into nursing. Um, to have we even thought of uh, providing that pathway uh, so that they know they don't have to leave the organization and we'll support them on that journey. So, you know, kind of externally upcoming, um, internally, how do we uh, make sure that there's pathways for people to explore different things, even within their uh, the same industry and same company or hospital that they're working in. And then also um, externally for those already in the workforce, uh, that second career uh, where or those that are, you know, feel a calling uh, into taking care of people, taking care of their community uh, and are looking for, especially in Arizona, uh, you know, that second uh, career options. How do we make sure that that's a, a clear pathway as well? So really looking at those um, and, and making sure that it's defined and, and people feel comfortable and confident in, in accessing one of those pathways. Thank you. Martin, asking a question that maybe isn't always the easiest. When you talk about United ABA and the program, the three-year program, it doesn't always sound like the cheapest thing to offer. So when we talk about the cost of a three-year program like this, how is United ABA able to justify the cost of the program itself? So hey, you're absolutely right. There's a cost um, to the business. Uh, where our apprentices are full-time employees, full-time benefits. And so... Um, the the business case when we're making the business case for it we have to look at the the overall long-term goal of the business and what we're trying to do 
Um, there are some uh, programs and different things now through uh, federal funding and some of the state grants through the state apprenticeship programs and that where we can get some funding, some reimbursement. Uh, there's been a push. Uh, the, uh, the Arizona State Governor's Office uh, has mentioned and has been involved in uh, several initiatives to promote uh, vocational education, apprenticeship programs, and things like that. So there are resources available for registered apprentices, which, which we are, uh, in getting some, even at the federal level um, and, and the state level. So there is some uh, help on that side. But the biggest, um, big, 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 biggest push for the business case is really the end product. And um, when we when we sit down and we look at the the cost of recruiting, the cost that's spent going out in your in your marketing, your advertising, you're bringing people in, the um, the revenue, and this will kind of go back to retention as well. Um, you know, you pour several years into training employee and then they leave. Um, uh, that that's a cost to the business. And so when we talk about tackling not only recruiting and uh, getting the employees here and getting them through that learning curve and up to speed, uh, but how do we also keep them? It comes back again to, um, I, I think Hans was mentioning it, uh, talking about investing in your employees and getting them to understand that you know the company is investing in them and they're more likely to stay. And so uh, on an overall, we can make a pretty strong business case by running numbers that, you know, the cost of going recruiting, getting someone, going through the learning curve process, which in our field could take up to a year, and then having and keeping them the retention, uh, as well as what we get. And so that where it goes back to through our program, what's, what they're getting is not a brand new mechanic. They're getting someone with three years experience on our product. And so... The investment really pays off on the end side of it, uh, and but there's no doubt it is a cost to a company to bring in more employees. It's more headcount, um, as well as to understand they're not going to be up to full speed. There is class time. There is training time. There's a cost of learning curve. But what I found is that the, the apprentices, when they understand that the business is investing in them and the quality that they're getting, they're responding on the other side uh, with uh, their efforts in the business. And we're actually seeing them surpassing our expectations for how quickly they're learning, how quickly they're able to start doing tasks and bringing, bringing real revenue in on the bottom line for the business. And so the getting apprentices excited and engaged, as well as once they know that you're investing in them, uh, they're returning that on the other side. And so our initial our initial fears are always are what's what's going to happen on the numbers? How bad is this going to cost the business? And what we're finding is it's actually numbers wise benefiting the business. We can show that to the accounting team, and that's where we get excited. Uh, it's not some random guess that you know we're somehow saving you know hundred thousand dollars a year. We're able to put numbers to it to show that these kinds of programs are healthy for the business and creating not just uh, a good stable workforce, but the culture it's creating uh, by doing that as well. Awesome. And then a great thing you mentioned is keeping them excited and engaged. And that's a huge part of these apprenticeships, especially when they're as long as three years. Matt, you mentioned yours is four years, that program. Being able to keep someone accountable and determined and, like you said, engaged in that four-year time span, how are you able to tackle that? Um, a, a lot of it is I guess mentoring, uh, good communication, open open dialogue, and uh, just showing them. And, and there's a lot of progression within their career path. So their apprenticeship program is set up in tiers. So as you acquire more training, on the job training and experience, and then the academic side of it, you're constantly moving up in salary. So there's a clear pathway for you to get to the salary that the minimum salary that you deserve, right? being a trained, having the knowledge, skills, and ability to perform the job that, that you're interested in or the career that you're interested in. Um, so I think that keeps people excited knowing that, hey, if I continue to do this, I'm going to make more money. And um, and then the, the support function of their mentor and, you know, their field leader, um, as well as, you know, my team constantly, you know, pushing them to do more and want to be more and 
offering um, some tutoring if they need help um, and working with, you know, our partner Rika and, and seeing whatever we can do to help them succeed. Um, it's, it's worked out really well to the point of, you know, people want their siblings, their brothers, their sisters to, to join the industry. Um, and the other things that we offer is to keep them intrigued is, uh, we have a learning management system, uh, that we're starting to build upon to offer online classes. So somebody can focus deeply on their education, vigorously educate themselves without, you know, someone forcing it down their, down their throat, right? There are opportunities there. The, the more that you want to apply yourself, uh, we have stuff that's available for you. Um, and it's just going to help you, you know, succeed throughout your career. Hans, I asked you a similar, similar question. You talk about your young girls inspiring them to get into maybe United Aviate one day. Why is it so important to invest in our youth? Well, I think that uh, we have to show what truly is available uh, as a career field, uh, how we're investing in those pathways. I just think overall, we want to make sure that um, the, the world is presented in a way uh, that shows that there's access pathways for them to, uh, to truly grow and develop skill sets. Uh, and there's truly interest uh, from companies uh, that we're, you know, not, we're, not, we're not nameless, faceless organizations. Uh, we are organizations made up of people that are passionate about the mission and vision of that organization. And so um, showing that and giving them pathways to experience that, experience that culture, um, and then be able to pick and choose uh, where and what culture and mission and vision fits them. Uh, and then have that kind of like bi bi bilateral investment, I think uh, goes a long way. I, I truly believe that uh, we have to inspire the next generation um, and really show them what uh, is going to, you know, uh, allow us to continue to advance as a culture and as a, as a country um, and show all the different things that, that really make that up. You know, uh, tech is not the only industry um, that is out there. And in fact, even for tech to be successful, you need other industries to do that. So uh, I think that really um, showing and giving um, the opportunity to, to really understand uh, all the different things that have to kind of come together for us to continue to grow as a society and to in, in, in improve the quality of life in, in so many different facets um, and all the different pieces that come together to work. One, exposing uh, uh, the younger generation to what that is uh, and then giving clear pathways for them to navigate into it and find their passion points. Because ultimately the cost of turnover, um, both for the employee and for the organizations are just lost productivity uh, overall for a uh, for an economy, you know, on a macroeconomic standpoint, transitional, if, if we are consistently transitioning employees either across industries or as they're experiencing new ones, you know, you get to a certain uh, percentage of the population doing that and you lose economic value and GDP uh, flat out because there's just too many people um, that are not at, uh, working at a, a productive level as they consistently transition. So having people experience that, know what their passions are, um, and have pathways to uh, to achieve those things early on, and and having them you know have those experiences and really uh, fall in love with something and then pursue that uh, really just overall helps us as a society be more productive uh, and achieve better quality of life for for everyone. Excellent. I want to be sure to address the questions here in the ch chat. That is on my cell phone. <laughs> All right. Not being a millennial, gentlemen, I'm going to address the questions here. <laughs> All right. So a question from one of our audience members. Are all of these paid internships or all, I can't read this, are these all paid apprenticeship programs? What is the pay rate? What is the specific name of the program at Abrazo? So if we can just, I guess, answer all of this first. Um, um, is this, does everyone have a paid opportunity? There's paid, op um, uh, there's paid opportunities and there are unpaid opportunities. The high school opportunity that we talked about is an experiential opportunity. It's not a paid one. It's over the summer for you to experience, um, you know, multi uh, well, multiple different facets of healthcare and you know, hopefully find some passion points. Uh, the externships, uh, which are in a varied degree of licensed practitioners, would be radiology, scrub techs, nurses, and you name any of the licensed uh, clinicians in the in the hospital field, those extra chips are paid. 
Um, and then residencies, uh, you were actually in that field, you were fully licensed, uh, and it's truly a, a cultural experience for those that are within the first year of their uh, newly licensed profession to have mentorship and um, camaraderie as part of that. So um, obviously, as they're fully practicing in that field, uh, it's paid at, at that rate. And a specific question for you, what is the program itself called? So the summer learning program is uh, what it is for the high school students. Uh, externships is for those that are in school, and that is by modality. Uh, so the externship is uh, different by each modality, but it's referred to as, you know, radiology extern, nurse extern, scrub tech extern. Uh, and then the residencies are offered once you're uh, as a part of the organization. If you're within your first year, then you can go into the residency program. Perfect. Matt, is this a paid apprenticeship? Yes, this is 100% paid from from day one when you start with us. Okay. Martin? Yes, we do not have any unpaid opportunities right now. So uh, they are hired as full-time employees, full benefits, uh, full pay uh, for, as part of the uh, state apprenticeship program. Uh, our pay scales are posted on their site for uh, how they move through the programs. They start off, for example, at 19 or so at $17 an hour as you complete parts of the program. Six months later, it's nineteen dollars an hour, and, and so on. And so that's if someone needs wants to see the full uh, scale of that, they can go on the uh, Arizona State Apprenticeship website and see how the program flows from a pace perspective. Perfect. There is another question here in the chat. I want to be sure to address. Will you be asking the other panelists about the connections and difficulty with them with secondary students? I work in a high school district and we do have relatively healthy connections with healthcare employers, but I'm curious about the experiences of the other two. Gentlemen, if you don't mind answering them. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, a lot of the high schools are developing, if, if they don't already have a program, a construction technology program going, uh, they can encourage their students to take one semester in that and They'll, in construction technologies, they'll learn a lot of the basics from all different trades so they can help them figure out, you know, what they're most passionate about, what they're most interested in. It also gives them a good opportunity to, to work with their hands and, you know, understand some <clears throat> basic hand tool safety and, uh, you know, what happens whenever you turn a screw to the right, whether you turn it to the left. Uh, but, yeah, I get it. Get in touch with your counselor. Um, you could probably um, start researching uh, different schools within your industry or within your school district. I know Westmec has a, a really an excellent program for construction, um, as well as some of the other entities here, healthcare, and um, I'm not sure if they have anything for aviation, but um, they're they're an excellent. School. Uh, from from my side, they're uh, working with high school high school students uh, is unique in some some of the challenges that it has. Uh, there's a I think from an employer standpoint, uh, there's an understanding of uh, generational uh, uh, expectations of work. Uh, we're running into something like that uh, where uh, our, our students that are coming out and entering the workforce have a different view of work. And put different value in certain things. For example, uh, you know, a work schedule and, and work life balance and these kinds of things. So dealing with um, the the high school uh, ed population as they're coming into the workforce, I think uh, employers have to be ready for some of those challenges and uh, in how to address those, whether it's in scheduling or things uh, things of that nature. Uh, the second thing is really in um, the learning curve. Uh, that we're seeing in having to get them up to speed, particularly for an industry. Um, aviation maintenance is uh, uh, takes a lot of training. And so uh, people's lives are depending on the work that we do. And so there is a, a level of maturity and readiness for it, as well as the technical skill. It takes time to build that. And uh, most high school programs typically don't have that kind of time to develop them at a full level. Uh, there are some high school-based programs uh, in the U.S. Uh, Westmec does have one, uh, but what we're finding is the students that come out of those uh, really go need a transition. Uh, one of the parts of our program uh, that we've 
we've got on the whiteboard potentially for the future is a true transition program uh, for bringing the high school population into our industry because uh, there's a lot of places that, that they just aren't prepared for that being able to run at a full mechanics level. Um, I'm speaking generalities. There are one or two exceptions where they are, uh, but for the most part, there's a transition, not just into our industry, but I think into the workforce and work in general, um, understanding uh, uh, the expectations of employers in terms of professionalism and a working environment. For many high schools, uh, students, this will be their first job, their first professional experience, their first time actually interacting as an adult in a uh, industry. And so there's a lot of professionalism. There's a lot of business training uh, that they in mentoring that they really need to get a handle on to really be successful. So those are some of the challenges that that we have when we when we bring in um, people straight out of the secondary environment is uh, working through some of those challenges as an employer and trying to meet address them. Uh, the end goal really being how can they be successful employees for us. Perfect. Now, gentlemen. I want to give each of you a chance to give closing remarks here. The overarching theme is that workforce development and these businesses, they need to be invested in order to increase retention and keep the talent here in the West Valley and really invest in our youth that we mentioned today. If each of you want to touch on the passion that you have for that or how your business is doing that, just as a final remark. We'll start with you. All right. Um, so within our organization, you know, we build projects, um, but ultimately, uh, we don't use people to build our projects. We use our projects to build our people. And um, it's extremely uh, diverse, um, I guess, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's extremely diverse uh, community of people that build things. Um, and I would say that you will find your passion uh, within the construction industry, um, whether you want to work in the office, whether you want to continuously build things in the field, if you want to advance your career into something like uh, virtual construction, you know, there's opportunities for everyone within the industry. And um, it's all about, you know, how much you want to put into it and uh, is what you're going to end up getting out of it. So. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have your mind made up for exactly what it is that you want. Uh, you can get your feet wet, get in there, build a foundation and start exploring different parts of the business. And there's a lot of similarities between, you know, all, all of our businesses here where, you know, the professionalism is a key component to success um, and just overall, you know, how well you apply yourself and your determination to be more and, and do more. For, for me, I would say it's uh, one of the things when we talk about developing the workforce and particularly in the West Valley, I think as a, as a business and employer, uh, the expectation that the schools are going to provide a, a ready workforce ready to go or that you're going to be able to attract all the talent you need at the right level, um, I think it's going to be very difficult. I think that's going to be a hard expectation to meet. And uh, it, it was for particularly for us in our industry, but there are options. And I think one of the, the great options is experiential learning, the apprenticeship programs. We're finding tremendous amount of success in investing in uh, just opening up, exposing people to the business and then investing in them and in their training. Um, I think that uh, for, from our perspective, uh, the employer is going to have to take on a greater burden of that training and that development of the employee. Uh, but I think that that investment uh, will pay off. And I think uh, it will also help create a culture that is going to help with the things like retention. It's one thing to pour into an employee and spend years uh, uh, training them. Uh, but how do you retain them? How do you keep them and really keep them in a culture that's going to promote your business and the growth of the West Valley as a whole? Um, I would strongly consider or encourage employers to really look at the apprenticeship program, some of the models that are set up, and see if that is something that can work for your uh, business. And uh, going all the way down into uh, the elementary and grade school levels. Uh, we talked about secondary schools, uh, but even now exposing 
our uh, secondary uh, or our elementary level students to career paths, career opportunities, let them know what businesses are around them in their community. I think that's going to be essential to uh, developing a strong workforce in the West Valley. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, not to belabor the points that have already been discussed, but but ultimately, you know, an organization that has a culture of innovation uh, where employees as well as, um, you know, the, the partners that they work with, vendors and, and external uh, uh, forces that they work with are uh, listened to. Uh, and then we try different things and it's OK to fail. And so the, I think having that type of environment is something that people enjoy being in, and especially if it's aligned with the mission and vision that they align with personally. And so I think that uh, creating these innovative pathways for people to connect uh, to a workforce and become a part of one and to experiment with that and to, to really find their passion points and then be able to, once they're in that workforce, um, uh, have avenues to then share that experience with others. And so it becomes a force multiplier effect that, um, you know, I did this and this is why it was beneficial to me. Um, and then get to share it with their neighbors, get to share with the, the high schools and other educational opportunities. So um, I think that we have to have a, a, a culture of sharing and learning and innovation, uh, and that will continue to foster uh, an engaged workforce and, uh, and one that um, the avenues that we create to get people into the workforce will also keep them retained. Well said. Well, gentlemen, I thank you all so much for your time, the amazing, amazing conversation. I thank everyone in the audience. Thank you for tuning in. We hope to see you next time.